Good morning and happy Sabbath and welcome you to church service today from Harrison, Arkansas. Here we are in another empty church, but soon, very soon, I believe that we might be able to meet together again. Hopefully within the next few weeks, maybe a month, we'll all be back together again. Uh, just a couple of announcements to be made before uh, we get started. As you know, we have uh, different ways of getting together. Every Tuesday at 6 o'clock, the Clinton Church has prayer meeting. Everyone's invited. That'll be on Zoom and on Facebook. Every Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. and at 6.30, uh, 10.30 a.m., Harrison has a morning prayer meeting. Everyone invited to that. And at 6.30, Harrison and Marshall have prayer meeting. Again, these are all on the Zoom uh, or on the uh, Facebook Live. And then, of course, every Sabbath morning we get together. We have Sabbath school at 10 a.m. Uh, this morning we started something new, but we did it at uh, 9.45. Where we got together with Pastor Ross, and he uh, asked you for questions and testimonies, and that went very well. We'll be doing that again next week, I believe, at 9.45. And then 11 o'clock we'll have church service. You know, it's just a blessing to be able to get together. I was talking with uh, Brother Daniel just a while ago, and he said what a blessing it was just to come back to the church building again and be able to worship at, at the church you know with the few of us that are here we are under the 10 people that we need to be but uh it, it is just a blessing to be here and be able to to gather together and share in god's word and be able to share with you on zoom and facebook live before we get started let's have a word of prayer let's bow our heads heavenly father lord we thank you for the blessings that you place in our lives we thank you for the tribulations lord that going through this we realize just how important it is to gather together with like believers where we can encourage one another and lord we look forward to that day when we can get together again as a family uh, where we can give the hugs that we desire to give the, the handshakes the welcome and lord to praise your name as a corporate body physically together but lord till that time we're going to do this uh, through the technologies you've given us let us worship your name, lift you up on high, and let us be lifted up, Lord, into your word. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're going to sing number 246, Worthy, Worthy is the Lamb. Just because we don't get to gather together doesn't mean that we can't lift one another up in accessory prayer. You know, Sister uh, Woolsey was describing over in uh, Sabbath school this morning 
how Chattanooga, Tennessee, had just got destroyed with the tornado and how Collegedale had really taken a lot of damage and her son was over there, uh, had recently been working in the uh, Collegedale, Chattanooga area. It just so happened to be that day, that day, he was in Nashville instead of one of those cities. He got a job and he wasn't in his uh, normal area when it really devastated that area. So, you know, just the blessings of being placed out of harm's way just for a moment to save a life, to save uh, uh, your mind and everything. It's, it's amazing what God does for us. And we think of the world today, how much we fear this virus, how much we fear being together. One day, this is all going to be cleared up. And it's not just the virus going to be cleared up. One day, all sin is going to be cleared up with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we need to look forward to that and lift each other up and explain one to another and to people who have never heard the name Jesus Christ and what he can do for us. You know, are you hurting today? And I'm sure many of us are. You know, send those prayer requests in the pastor and to me and to the, the church website, wherever you need to do, and we'll get them out here. But we want to pray for you. And at this time, we're going to bow our heads, and we're going to lift our prayers, our needs, our thoughts up to Jesus Christ on that cross that he forgave our sins on. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity you have given us to give all to you, Lord, because you have already given all to us. You have promised us eternal life. You have given us the hope of salvation that we do not deserve. And Lord, as we walk these, uh, these grounds of this earth, we're going to go through trials and tribulations, whether they be health, whether it be spiritual needs, whether it be physical needs. Lord, you are always there for us and with us, even through these difficult times. Lord, we look forward to the day that we get together uh, when your second coming and Lord, all sin will be gone forever, and we can live in the world that you have designed for us for all eternity. Lord, be with our brothers and sisters. We thank you for the blessings you placed before us, uh, the special blessings of getting us out of harm's way, uh, the ability to reach out to others and share with them the wonderful story of Jesus and what he has done for all of us. And Lord, we thank you for those opportunities you give us. Lord, help us to realize just how precious each moment we have is that we should be sharing the promises, the desires of uh, our heart should be on that hope, that glorious hope of your second coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I want to share a story with you about a young man. His name was Auguste Forel. And he loved to do something that probably you never thought of doing. But at 11 years old, he would struggle. All his friends from school would go out and play ball. Now and then he would go with them. But otherwise, he liked to go home and sit in the backyard. What would you do sitting in the backyard? Well, this young man liked to watch ants. Now, there's a verse in the Bible that says, consider the ants, but it also says, thou sluggard. It makes you want to watch the ants to see how they work because God's trying to tell us we should work like they do. But this young man just loved watching the ants. He would watch them go in single file from hole to hole. They could come out of the hole, they could have ran like people do in a gang or whatever, but they always did everything in order. And he learned how to dig so softly that he actually dug down to where he could see their tunnels and he could watch them follow their tunnels to rooms. And he discovered one room was a place where they put all their dead ants. They actually had a room where they kept them. And then he dug a little further and he found a room which was their storage room for food. He found uh, leaves and other things like that. What was unique one time when he was watching them, he, he also knew and noticed that there's flying ants, there's black ants, there's red ants, and he even found yellow ants. And one day as he was digging, he noticed that instead of just black ants in his yard, there had come in some red ants, and they had holes nearby. 
So he tunneled down and he found out that the red ants were in smaller holes because they're littler creatures than the black ants. And they would tunnel down into the black ants' storage and they would steal their leaves and things. And because they had smaller holes, when they grabbed a little piece of a leaf, if they could make it to their tunnel, the black ants couldn't follow them. So he thought that was wild, that instead of going getting their own food, they were actually tunneling into the black ants. Well, what did this young boy find out? He found out so many things, and every time he discovered something, he would make a note. He would write out about what he found, how he found it, and, and what the ants were doing. And eventually, as he got older, he decided to take all the notes that he had kept, and he wrote them in a book. And they discovered later his book by Auguste Forel was so intricate in what ants could do that even the scientists, the, the, the people that would research things, found out that he knew more about ants following them in the dirt than they could found out, find out about the ants in a, a laboratory. And he ended up having a very, very famous book. And that brings me to another Bible text. Besides uh, to research the ants because they're workers, there's a text that says Ecclesiastes 9.10. It says, whatever you do, always do your best. It tells you to put your whole strength into it. And that's what Auguste did at 11 years old. He put his best into discovering what ants do. And because of that, he's well known for writing one of the best books about ants. Amen. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'm going to see if I push the right button and the mic is on. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for that awesome story. We can learn so many things from God's creation and the critters he made. And thank you for giving us that insight. And speaking of giving our all and the talents God has given, this is a time in our worship service where we would normally invite our ushers to pass the offering plate. But you have two ways of not missing out on that blessing. One is to go to the Harrison Church website uh, or uh, Adventist Giving website, either one, and, uh, and request to make your donations through the Harrison Adventist Church or you can mail your contributions to the Clinton Church, the Marshall Church, or the Harrison Church. And our treasurers will be grateful to record uh, your donation. And more importantly, you will be blessed for the part you play in God's work. Would you join with me as we ask a blessing on these funds? Father in heaven, we ask that you will bless those who can give as well as those who cannot, that you would be close to each one listening here today and that you would take the funds that are contributed and multiply them and use them to help share your love, your good news, and to hasten your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning we are blessed to have a special speaker. I can't call him a guest speaker because uh, Daniel Fornes is not only a part of our Harrison Church family, but has also uh, spent many months as a part of the Amazing Facts family. And we're glad that he gets to be back home in Harrison right now and that he will be sharing the word with us in just a moment. But if you have your Bibles, there are some verses he would like for us to be praying about. And then we will hear a beautiful number and song from Beth Kaffenberger. And then Pastor Daniel Fornes will be sharing the word. Our scripture reading comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. 
What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Good morning. And like Pastor Ross said, my name is Daniel Fornes. For those of you in our extended church family in Clinton and Marshall that have not met me, it is a joy to be uh, sharing the message with you this morning. And so before we dive in, let's have a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much that despite what's going on around us, we are still able to come together through technology, through the media sources that we have, to share in our worship services together. Father, we pray that even though we're apart, we can grow closer together with each other, and Father, ultimately with you. Lord, I ask a blessing on this time now as I open up your word and share a message that you've given to me 
Father, may it be a blessing to those that hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So with all of this scare that's going on around us, with this virus that has crept upon us, it's got me thinking about a lot of different things. You know, people around us are getting sick, um, getting infected, some life-threatening, some not so much. But there's something very profound that has crept across my mind, and that is a question that we're going to come to a conclusion about this morning. And that question is, is it time to die? We've been isolated from each other, not able to meet on Sabbaths for worship, not able to come to Sabbath school, not able to go to prayer meetings. And I'm certain that this pandemic has been just a small test of our faithfulness. Because when you take away the ability of the body of Christ to meet together, to come together in the church, the limbs began to get weaker. And I will be honest with you this morning. When I'm used to meeting on Monday evenings, and Wednesday evenings, and Sabbath mornings, and Sabbath afternoons, and outreach on Sabbath, and going to people's homes various different days of the week to do Bible studies, that when, when all of that is taken away and it comes to a stop, friends, are you strong enough to stand alone? And I'll give you the answer to that quick question, and that answer is no. None of us in and of ourselves are strong enough to stand alone, but there is an answer. Jesus is strong enough. Amen. Jesus is not only strong enough to stand alone like he did, he's strong enough to carry you with him. So how are we to survive these trials and tests of the last days? Friends, it's only by dying that we can truly survive. Dying to self and living through and for Jesus Christ. We're going to be discussing what, what does it look like, what does it mean to die? See, to the world, a life of surrender is an ugly thing. It goes against our nature as human beings. A life of self-sacrifice, self-denial, discomfort, even suffering for the glory of God, by our nature, we look at that and say, that's an ugly life. I want no part of it. Even the word surrender itself carries certain negative connotations with it, right? That's what happens to the bad guys, or that's what happens to the losing team. They surrender. But the Christian life of surrender doesn't have to be a negative thing. The Christian life of surrender is a wonderful, the word surrender for the Christian is a wonderful word because it means throwing ourselves into the arms of the Almighty, dying in the arms of Jesus, and being resurrected with the newness of life. You see, Satan always tries to throw a counterfeit in everything that God has created. If you've ever been to a prophecy seminar, you will learn about Satan's great counterfeits. You see, the irony of this truly surrendered life is um, to the world, the, the unsurrendered, to, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> but to the sur a surrendered Christian, to the world looks ugly but to God a truly surrendered Christian is the most beautiful thing so this morning we're going to look at the aspects of surrendering to Jesus as we turn with me to the book of John chapter 6 in John chapter 6 we find a, uh, a question here John chapter 6, and we're going to jump all the way down to verse 68. Now, this was after Jesus was preaching in the synagogues, and he, he started to tell his followers that they needed to drink his blood and eat of his flesh. And many of the, the followers of Christ at that time thought that that was a very profound thing to say and began to walk away. And jump down to verse 68, it says, But Simon Peter, 
or uh, verse 67. But then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Friends, if we want true freedom, true pleasure, and true happiness, what other choice do we have? Like Peter here, we can ask that same question. Lord, to whom shall we go? You know, it's great that the Bible gives an answer to this question. This question is one that's been studied by one of the greatest minds of Earth's history. You could say one of the, the greatest scientists uh, that have ever lived. And we have the results of that study in our Bibles. We'll turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to read our, our opening verse that we had there. In Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, we read, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You see, this was the answer that Solomon gave to that question, Lord, to whom shall we go? But you know, whenever God gave Solomon this answer, he also gave him, or this question, he gave him everything he would need to study this question in depth. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 4, the Bible says that God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. It says also a largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. So I think you would agree with me when I say that Solomon was more than qualified to answer this question. Lord, to whom shall we go? In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 3, Solomon says, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom. How to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. So we see here that Solomon is investigating this question, Lord, to whom shall we go? You see, in everything, Solomon had an abundance. I can probably assure to you today that we will never have as much wisdom as Solomon. We'll never have as much fame as Solomon. We'll never have as much wealth or pleasure that Solomon had. And in everything, this abundance God gave to him so he could prove once and for, and for all that even everything, everything that this world has to offer is not enough apart from God. Brothers and sisters, the more that we indulge self, the more unsatisfied we become. I find more pleasure in working for Jesus than working for myself. You know, before my time on the road working with a, uh, an evangelist team for Amazing Facts, I had several different jobs and several different goals and aspirations of my life that I was chasing and trying to succeed at. And friends, I can tell you today that the past four years of my life being on the road, preaching the gospel and winning souls for Jesus Christ has been the most happiest time of my life. Sure, it doesn't pay great. All my other jobs or most of my other jobs, I could have made way more money, had way more things acquired for myself that the world tells you will, will please you or make you happy. But friends, I decided to give that up and test Jesus. And Lord, he, er, he proved true. The Lord proved true. My life being on the road, witnessing for Jesus has been more happy than any job I'd ever had in the past. And I can tell you probably more than any job I'll ever have in the future. We read, uh, staying in the book of Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastes, we go over to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, Solomon's kind of giving his, uh, his ending statement here. And in verse 13, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. 
In the book, You Shall Receive Power by Ellen White, she says, true happiness will be the result of every self-denial. When we surrender ourselves completely unto God, he gives us this peace that the Bible says passes all understanding. There was a, a missionary by the names of James Calvert, and he was on his way to uh, witness to the cannibal tribes of Fiji. And the captain of the boat that was taking him up the river that they were on turned to those guys and he said, you know, you men are fools for going to live among these tribes. You're going to die. They will kill you. You know what James's reply was to this man? He said, sir, we died before we came here. Do you have fear about anything in your life? Fear of what's going on today, even as we speak here. Maybe it's because you haven't surrendered that part of your life to Christ. So the Bible says that there is a peace and a freedom that comes when you own nothing, even yourselves. So when this tornado passes through the land and it picks your house up and carries it away, that you can look at that and say, well, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but uh, your house just left. <laughs> or when a thief comes by, steals your car, your only transportation to get you to work or even to church, that you can look at that and say, Lord, um, I hate to tell you this, but uh, someone just stole your car, so I don't know what you're going to do. But friends, when we surrender every part of our lives, our health, our houses, our lives, everything. Friends, that's when we find true happiness because when we give it to God, he can take better care of it than we can. And we don't have the stress of ownership. I remember in 2005, Hurricane Katrina came through on um, the south down on the Gulf. And I, I was uh, in, still in high school and my uncle decided that we were going to go down there and help some of the people that had damaged homes. And you know, while I was down there helping put new roofs on and tearing out drywall, I couldn't help but think, I am sure glad this isn't my house. Mm. Friends, because when we don't have ownership of it, then that stress level is just not there. And so everything that we have in life, we surrender to God and the stress of ownership gets transferred to the one who can truly provide. A newly converted man was talking with his friends. <laughs> they said to him, I see you've decided to give up all your pleasures. To which he replied, no, no, the fact lies the other way. I have just found all my pleasures and given up all my follies. Friends, that's what true surrender is. Satan gives us these counterfeits of everything God has wanted to give us, and they desensitize us to the truth from God. The devil tries to overstimulate our lives so we will not enjoy the subtle flavors of life. See, God is the one that created us. He designed us to enjoy the pleasures of life. He's the one that created us to enjoy the beauty and warmth of a morning sunrise coming up over the mountains. He's the one that designed our taste buds to bite into a juicy fruit and just taste the, all the goodness that's in there. He designed us to be able to listen and enjoy music. But for every good God has designed, the devil has made provisions for counterfeits. See, the, str the strange thing about this is that the devil has been so successful at this unbalancing act of God's intent that when a person finally does surrender and get back in balance with God, they look unbalanced to the rest of the world and sometimes even unbalanced to those around them in church. Did you hear what I said? That when someone finally gets back in balance with God... To the rest of the world, they look unbalanced. There was a, a time that we were doing a evangelistic series in Minnesota. And it 
always caught me off guard that I would find these instances within God's church, within his people, of criticism of those who wanted a truly surrendered life. One example I'll give is uh, at this church, I overheard a, a gentleman criticizing another family for having a more simplistic diet than what the world will offer us. And to me, I was thinking we shouldn't be criticizing, even if we ourselves have not made it to that point of a surrendered diet to the Lord, we should never criticize a fellow brother or sister for taking that leap. It should always be a, a, a congratulations or a way to go or a good for you. You can be a good example to me, but never criticize See, the, the, uh, the world is in this process of condensing, refining, and processing things so much that they're overstimulating and unsatisfying. And that's just what Satan does. How many of you have ever tried to eat a raw sugar cane? Anybody here? We have one person here that has tried to raise their hand. Is it sweet? Yeah, it's sweet as sugar, right? But it's got that fiber in there. It's, you could probably not overdo it on sugar by eating sugar cane before you would fill up. But when you take that sugar cane and you condense it, you refine it, and you process it into what we have now as table sugar, well, you could take one bite of a candy bar and your entire body goes into overdrive because of a sugar rush and a sugar high. You see, it's more stimulating but also unsatisfying. And did you know that the food marketers out there scientifically engineer food to make it more um, stimulating and unsatisfying? How many of you have ever just ate one, one potato chip out of a bag? And you think that's coincidence? That's science. That is the, the marketers and the researchers developing something that will get you addicted but not satisfy you, so you keep coming back. Let's talk about cheese. Cheese is made from milk, right? Milk is a good thing. It's designed for new life to come into this world. But when you take that same cheese and you condense it, you refine it, and you process it so much to the point that it's almost pure fat and salt, well, friends... Most of you are probably having a watering mouth right now. <laughs> because does it taste good? Yes, it does. But it's probably not the best for you. And the same can be said for movies. That we can find in one drama movie more emotions than could fill a lifetime. You watch one movie on TV and you see countless murders you see affairs, you see marriages, you see love, you see brokenness. And we get so worked up and so stimulated by that that we become desensitized to the realities of which we live. In um, Councils of Church, page 164, Ellen White says, There is no influence in our land more powerful to poison the imagination, to destroy religious impression, and to blunt the relish of the tranquil pleasures and sober realities of life than theatrical amusements. The love for these scenes increase with every indulgence, and the desire for intoxicating drink strengthens with its use. You see, as we, we, we think that our, our kids can watch all these videos, watch all these movies, and then we want to discipline them or get onto them when they can't sit still in a pew and listen to 30 minutes of preaching. And we wonder, why are they misbehaving? It's because we've overstimulated not only them, but ourselves. Have you ever been sitting in church, about to fall asleep, not attentive, and not because you're tired, but because it may seem boring? Friends, God wants a surrendered life in every aspect, in our diet, in our income, in our entertainment. In everything that we have, God wants it. He wants to get us back to that state of a pure, simple life, rid of all these processed and refined, stimulating experiences that dull our minds. God is leading 
a peculiar people. They will not be like the world, and self-denial is not a bad thing. God knows what is best for us, and he has even more pleasure in store for us. Have you ever eaten a donut right before you drank a cup of orange juice? Now that juice after that donut would taste kind of sour, wouldn't it? You see, that's a perfect example of the pure, sweet flavors that God has for us being destroyed by the, the over-condensed and refined processes of the world. And Satan does that most certainly with our minds through what we watch, through what we eat, and through every part of our life, really. He wants to overstimulate us so we can't enjoy the subtle pleasures of life. Those who make God first, last, and best in everything are the happiest people in the world. So surrender doesn't have to be a bad word. Surrender is a life of purpose, of peace, and of pleasure. We started this off talking about this pandemic that happened, and I truly believe that this pandemic was a small test of our self-denial. I can tell you from my own experience, we can turn this into a confession right now, but over the last four years, I have been living from church to church to church, most of the time living in their parking lot, sometimes when our RV was on fire or broken down, living in the church. And so my whole life has been wrapped up in church all week long for the last four years. And when all that accountability around you is gone and you're left standing alone, what's it look like? When you're prevented from meeting on Sabbath or for worship, or yeah, meeting on Sabbath for worship, what does your house look like that day? Do you have worship in your home? It does your home become the church? When prayer meeting is held over the phone, and you don't have to go to a public meeting place. How invested are you? I know I'm not the only one that this message is reaching. When God put this on my heart, he knew that there would be someone else out there. Maybe it's you. Maybe right now you're realizing that if this was the, a final test of the end times, maybe you wouldn't be ready. When we are isolated, we begin to fall apart. The Bible makes a promise that Jesus will stand with us. I know these past few months, not being able to come to church, not being able to go to prayer meeting, my studies have dwindled. I've been in my Bible less because I know there's not a meeting at the church coming up that I'm going to have to go to and give thoughts and talk about the, the verses and, and studies that I've been studying. And so friends, honestly with you here today, that I would have failed this test. If this was a test of the end times, friends, I wouldn't be ready. And I tell you that today because I want you to be ready. I want you to see this as a true test that I believe that it is. That when we are pulled apart from what holds us together, from what we think holds us together, our accountability, friends, what's it look like? Are we still the same? Are we the same person? Do we still have that same relationship with Jesus that we show we do when we're in a public place at church? Friends, they say that the true test of a Christian is his house. And I can tell you that mine needs some work. Friends, the only way we are to survive the end times is to truly die into the arms of our Lord. Only then will we have the strength to carry on when the world around us is falling. I said, let me walk in the fields. He said, no, walk in the town. I said, there are no flowers there. He said, no flowers but a crown. I said, but the skies are black. There is nothing but noise and din. And he wept as he sent me back. He said, there is more. There is sin. I said, but the air is thick and fogs are veiling the sun. 
He answered, Yet souls are sick, and souls in the dark are done. I said, I shall miss the light, and friends will miss me, they say. He answered, Choose tonight if I am to miss you or they. I pleaded for time to be given. He said, It is hard to decide. I will not seem, it will not seem so hard in heaven to have followed the steps of your guide. I cast one look at the fields, then set my face to the town. He said, My child, do you yield? Will you leave the flowers for the crown? Then into his hand went mine, and into my heart came he. And I walk in a light divine, the path I had feared to see. Friends, my prayer today is that you will sincerely think about this message. Consider your lives and how they have been affected by this social, social isolation. Friends, if you found yourself wandering away from scripture and wandering away from study, it's time to come back. It's time to open our Bibles and continue this life that we profess so that we can stand strong in the trials of the last days. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us here today. Lord, I thank you for the message that you've given me this morning. My prayer is that not, it not only affects me and my life, but those that have heard it. Lord, if there's anyone listening to this today that has not made that decision to truly surrender their hearts and their lives to you, Father, I pray that you would press upon them now to do so. The world around us is falling apart into chaos and ruin, and Lord, we need strength in this time more than ever. We draw strength from each other, but when we're isolated from each other, Father, where can we get our strength? Lord, we turn to you. Give us that strength that we need each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing song is called Living for Jesus.
you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, thank you for the prayer that is echoed in the song we have just been blessed with. And thank you for the message that you have spoke to our hearts through as Brother Daniel has shared from your word. We thank you for these moments that, while they seem like chaos all around, can draw us closer to you than ever before. We ask, Lord, that you would prepare us for your very soon return and that you would use us to share that blessed hope with everyone you bring across our path. May it be your joy and your peace that fill our hearts and bless us throughout this coming week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family and friends, we thank you so much for joining us today. We pray you have a blessed and happy and wonderful rest of the Sabbath and a great week with Jesus. Please remember, Tuesday evening at 6.30, we invite you to join with our uh, Clinton prayer meeting on Zoom. And we invite you, uh, uh, in fact, I misspoke, that would be 6 p.m., 6 o'clock on Tuesday night with Zoom for Clinton prayer meeting, and then Wednesday for prayer meeting in Harrison, also via Zoom. And please don't hesitate to text or call or email with your praise reports and prayer requests. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Bye for now. <laughs>